All right, I suppose I can get started here. Welcome to my talk, everybody. My name is Jeff Dickey. I'm uh, the CLI engineer at Heroku. I work on the Heroku tool belt, which happens to be a great place to host a JavaScript application. Um, I'm at DickeyXX on everything. The code I'm going to be using in these slides is all available on my GitHub page. It's an app called social-app. Uh, and I also have a few Medium posts I wrote the last couple of weeks kind of leading up to this about mean stack development and that kind of stuff. So definitely a good place to look at if you're interested in learning more. Last year I wrote a book uh, for Pearson Publishing called Write Modern Web Apps with the Mean Stack. And in the few weeks leading up to writing this, I did a lot of research into different ways that you can write a mean application, different types of architecture that work, trying to find conventions that work well, trying to find things that didn't. And I put this talk together as kind of a, a use case of a building a simple project and questions you might be asking yourself and different things you might be going through when you're putting together one. So the app that we're going to be looking at today is a pretty standard social networking app. Social networking apps end up being a pretty good example for testing out ideas on infrastructure because it's really, uh, one, it, it looks like a lot of apps do nowadays. Like most apps have like a feed and have some kind of concept of following people. Uh, but these are also kind of, they can be pretty difficult things uh, when you try to start talking about scale. There's a lot of things that are interconnected, and a lot of data you're dealing with. So ours is going to be about as simple as it could be. We're just going to have the ability to create posts and uh, see, uh, see a news feed of posts by users that we're following. So when we're putting app together, obviously we've got to look at what tools we're using. And I'm using the term tools in a really generic sense here. So this is like what language are we going to use, what front end framework, what library, all that kind of stuff. It's the stuff that I think that developers really like to talk about anyways. So to start with, I'm going to use Node.js, obviously being a mean application. And we're going to pick Node because um, for one reason it has a really powerful V8 engine. So you know, the V8 engine, as I'm sure most of you know, is, uh, was developed by Google in the Chrome browser, I think around 2008. And it really changed how web development was done up until that point. Because before that, any kind of JavaScript application could only run the browser for a few minutes before it would just get bogged down with memory leaks and just being slow with kind of, you know, maybe not the best dynamic language for performance. But it really turned this on its head. And I don't even know how it works, but you know, it's able to make JavaScript as fast as C in some cases, which is amazing for a language that doesn't even have integers. Um, but yet it does that. So we get the performance from that, but even more important than that is the invented I.O. Because JavaScript in the browser was limited to running in a single thread, uh, it has a lot of syntax around eventing I.O. So you never block on the I.O. And this really just adds concurrency. And that just translates to more users per API box. So very good stuff for a backend server. It also really has like a, what I call back to basics culture, really Unix kind of programming here. So you deal a lot with things like text streams, really simple modules. And I, I came from Ruby before Node, and it's kind of refreshing from that perspective because it's, it's a culture that really doesn't like magic. And I just find that there's a lot more simplicity, and I can get a lot closer to my data without things getting in the way. And in Node 4, which just came out a couple weeks ago, we get a lot of the ES6 features, which really turned JavaScript from being um, you know, the bad part of Node to being a pretty good language that's actually a really good treat to work with. And this includes things like string interpolation and generators and promises and a lot of stuff that is really what you want to see in a modern language. But more important than that, and especially in the context of this conference, is the huge amount of open source packages available. JavaScript has by far the most amount of code that's available on GitHub and in the package manager that you can use. So this is just a graph of packages that have been available over time. And you can see that Node is not just the highest, but it's rising at a really, really fast rate. And part of this is because it's the only language you can use on the browser, but it's also just because NPM is a good, good community and there's a lot of people doing work in Node. So one of those packages is express.js. This is one of the oldest packages for Node. It's probably about as old as, it, as Node itself. Um, and there's really only three uh, web frameworks for Node. Uh, this one is just a really simple web framework. It's, to call it a web framework is a little silly because like, coming from like Django and Rails, to me, this is just like a 
request server. Like, it doesn't have an ORM. It doesn't have any like, view stuff. It's very, very simple. This is probably like half of what you can do with it. But this is a full-fledged application here. It's just going to open up a, a, a server to listen on port 3000, whatever's in the port variable, and respond in the status check. And notably, if you want to run this on Heroku, you just have to listen to that port environment variable, and then it'll just work right out of the box. You have to have a package JSON to define the express dependency, but other than that, it'll just work. So with this in place, um, we're going to use MongoDB as our database. MongoDB really takes the best of the relational database and the NoSQL databases. So it gives us a lot of the, it's not quite SQL, obviously you can't do like joins and stuff, but it does give us uh, strong consistency. It's, a lot of people think it's uh, eventually consistent for some reason, but it's not. It's fully consistent out of the box. So with that, we also get the NoSQL um, flexibility and scalability and performance. <laughs> I'm nervous. So, with this in place, we get all the performance from a NoSQL database and all the scaling we get from that. So, anyways, I'm going to move on to Angular. So, with Angular, we get. Uh, we are able to generate the DOM within the browser. So this is opposed to the way that we developed applications before, where we would generate the HTML in the server, and then we'd export it through HTML angle brackets to the browser. So I'm sorry, guys. I'm like possibly nervous right now. <laughs> 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 All right. So with AngularJS, we can generate the DOM in the browser, and this really adds some good separation between the front end code and the back end code. Um, and this just results in cleaner code bases. In fact, we could have multiple repositories for both the front end and the back end with this kind of a setup. Um, and also, we can split the code up into modules. So I found with JavaScript before these kind of frameworks came out that I would um, really find myself, like if I needed to work on somebody else's feature that they built, I'd just go into some nest of JavaScript and I have to dump the whole thing and rewrite it from scratch because that was the only way to, to deal with it. But Angular really encourages you know, putting the right code in the right place and, um, and like where to put the right things. Like for example, a controller is a good place to interface with the view, but a service is a good place to interact with an API. So alongside that, we also get the dependency injection to go with the modules. And this allows us to write really testable code. And AngularJS is, is just really popular. I mean, any metric I want to find, like, it seems to be the most popular JavaScript web framework out there. Um, it, a lot of times people seem to mention the same breath as React, but this is just Google Trends. I know that's not a perfectly a uh, great way to validate a framework, but um, it's just one metric that I found that's kind of overwhelming. All right, so we've got all this stuff together, got our app out, and we show it to the boss, and it works great. We can go on here, put in the second post, the post shows up on the news feed, everything's great. So let's take a look at the code. I'm going to show this really simple interaction. It's nothing too complicated here. We're just going to do a GET request to the post endpoint, and it's going to return um, an array of all the, the posts, basically. So it's very, very simple interaction here. Uh, the data model is we have two collections. We have the posts and the users. Um, and this is the attributes on those two collections. So the users, each user is going to have a username, a password, an avatar URL, and it's going to have an array of all of the users that that user is following. Or the, it's an object ID, so essentially you can think of it like a foreign key. Uh, the post is going to have a user that created it, just an ID to him, as well as a, a string of all the body for that, for that post. And we're going to use Mongo, or sorry, Mongoose, as the uh, uh, ODM to interface between 
node and the database. And this allows us to define the schema, and so we can say like what's required and how the foreign, and there's not foreign keys, but like how references are linked to each other. And ultimately, this is what we want the uh, API to return, right? So it's going to just return a list of all the posts, but just the posts by themselves isn't enough because that would just have an ID of the user. We want all the user's information in there too. So you can kind of think of this as like a SQL join. Like I want all the posts joined with all the, um, with all the users. So to do this in MongoDB, we first define a request. We grab all the posts where the user is one of the ones that we're following. So that following is just a list of all the, it's just an array of all the users this one's following. We're going to sort it in reverse chronological order, inverse of the ID. And what populate user is going to do is in, in node land, after it gets all the posts in, it'll make another request to get all the users it needs and return those to the, to the JavaScript object. So we then just display, and that gets us right back to our result. So when you're storing the data in MongoDB, you don't store the user information with the post, you're just storing a reference ID? Yeah, I don't have a good example of that, aside from this, but, um, but yeah, each post just has a user ID, but because we, um, we say populate user, that's going to Makes get all those back. Yeah, so it's, it's actually more complicated in Node than it is in MongoDB, but that's a good thing, because you really want to push all the performance to the, to the app boxes. You don't want your database crunching, because the database is the most dangerous thing to go down. If that goes down, everything goes down. So while a SQL database might be able to do this in a cleaner way from the app developer's perspective, it's, it's really better to do it in this place, because you can scale these boxes up pretty much infinitely. Could you walk through Populate? How does it uh, uh, connect the user to the ID field, the user ID field that you got from the post? Yeah, so, so obviously you don't write this code. This is abstracted, right? Um, you said there was no magic a little while ago. <laughs> <laughs> You're not wrong. You got me there. So, <laughs> so yeah, this would just generally be, it would just be a user's ID here. Um, but what Mongoose, I actually don't know this for sure, but what I assume it does is it, it finds, okay, who are all the users that I need to find? It'll just do one request, like, give me users that match these IDs, and then just inject them in here. Because obviously there's going to be duplicates. It's not just going to go through each uh, post and say, give me the user for this one, give me the user for this one. It'll batch that up. I don't know how it understands which field it should use to find the right oh, user. Oh, I see what you're... That's what I'm missing. Gotcha. So that is actually defining the schema. Good question. Like, Mongo doesn't care. An object ID in Mongo is just an object ID. It doesn't get stored with any kind of metadata. But because I have this ref user in, in Mongoose, Mongoose is able to draw that. Although, it doesn't need it, because in MongoDB, an ID is unique through the whole database. So if you just get an object ID, you can find what's related to it. it the type doesn't matter. It's not like, you know, this auto incrementing number. It's like a a uh, number like, uh, like these. So anyway, so once we get that working, and Angular responds, uh, in Angular we can define a service, and this is how you can kind of break the code up. It's, it's never good to put the um, HTTP calls in control logic, so we make a little service here. We dependency inject all assign HTTP, and we're just going to return a GET request to that endpoint. And we'll define a controller. And this is just going to call that same service, which returns a promise, that when that promise is fulfilled, we add post to something called dollar sign $scope. And $scope scope is just a way to link a controller to a template. So the template looks like this. And we're just going to repeat a div for every post uh, in that dollar sign $scope array. Show the avatar URL, show the the user and show the body. I'll show that once more. Maybe. All right, maybe not. <laughs> uh oh. Oh, I'm moving too quick. All right, so here we're back here. So again, this is really kind of demonstrating like how 
you can split the code up. Obviously, this is a simple example, but we can keep all the control logic that's going to interface with like user events and stuff like that away from server interactions. Uh, and these can be in separate files, and they, I think they should be. Um, you can just concatenate them together, and you don't have to have like browserify or anything complicated like that. Just one file that's all of them combined. So I want to talk about authentication. Um, authentication is like, when you're putting these apps together, it's definitely the part that's the most time consuming. Um, and there's a lot of different ways to do it. Uh, with mean applications, JavaScript applications generally, you won't find like some off the shelf solution. Like in Ruby, we just use like OmniAuth and we'd be like, look, authentication's done. But anybody that has experience with something like that knows that those things tend to break down. So I like to get back to basics with authentication. I like to do it pretty much from scratch. So this is how I did it for this app. There's a, a login endpoint, and basically from Angular side, it's just going to take a username and password, post that to API login, and it's going to get back a token. And then for every re request it makes after that, it'll just add it to the auth token header. So that, that's from Angular's perspective. It just needs to do auth login, gets back a token, and it can just use that for all requests. And this is important to generate the newsfeed, right? Because I need to know who the user is that makes, that's making the requests, and I just want all of the posts that are users that they're following. So to do this, uh, I'm really a big fan of, of JOT tokens. Um, it's at RFC 7519, and it's really, uh, it's a new take on a very old idea. It's very simple, but it's a great way to do authentication. So th roughly the way it works is a JOT token is just uh, a string separated by two periods. So the first section is a base64 encoded header that just says like what algorithm it's going to use. The purple part is a base64 encoded JSON pay payload. And whatever that is, it doesn't matter. Um, it, it's usually going to have like the user's ID on it. So when this token comes back, the server knows who it is. And the final part is uh, just an HMAC signature. So the great thing about this is I can send this to a user or to a, a client, and they can send it back to me. And I know because of signature that's valid. And they can't modify anything in here. Even though they could read the payload, they could pull that out because it's just base64 encoded. It's not encrypted or anything. But they can't make any changes to it because it would invalidate the signature. So to use this in JavaScript, it's actually, in JavaScript, it's like one line of code to do this yourself. But there's um, a package out there called JSON Web Token made by the Auth0 guys that's really easy to use. So I create a payload. This is stuff I want to get back every time I get a new request. And um, I just sign it with, with Jot and a secret key. And really, I, like, I would put this in an environment variable in a real system. But just as a demo, it's just some string. And it gives me back a token. Then later, when this comes back in a request, I can verify it, and it's just going to come back as that same payload that I put in there. But I know it's valid. I know I made it, and there's been no, you know, they can't change the user ID, for example. So to use this, I'll define a request endpoint API login, and it's really simple. It's just going to sign the current user. Like first, it has to like get the user and make sure the password's valid with bcrypt. I didn't show that here. Um, but it's in the code if you want to look at it. Um, and I just grab that user, and I just send it back in as a token. Then I add some middleware where I just look for that auth token header. And if it's there, then I just check to see if it's valid, and I get back the user object, and I have the user ID. And the real great thing about this is it, it's, it's really stateless. right? There's no central session server. There's no central authentication. So if you want to do some like SOA microservice thing, this is really convenient, because you, any server just needs to have that secret key, and they can check, is this valid or not? And it even comes with more features like namespacing and expiring and a lot of stuff like that. It's all defined in the RFC. So we have this in place. We feel good about it. But the boss comes over, and he says, there's a bug. And the bug is that when he's on, well, let's say he's me, and he adds a post, his buddy Jose doesn't see the post come up. Now, we know why this is. It's because it doesn't refresh automatically. It has to know to get new posts. But this isn't how websites work nowadays. Like The amount of times people spend on a particular web page is, is much longer than it used to be. And users just kind of expect this, uh, this level of immersion that, that this isn't offering. So what we want to do is we want to ultimately have the post show up 
on both pages roughly at the same time or quickly. So to do this, I'm going to use WebSockets. Um, and what's going to happen is when Jeff makes a post to the server, the server is going to emit a WebSocket notification to all interested parties like, hey, you're following this user. He just made a post. And here's the ID for it. It can then say, OK, I'm on the newsfeed page. I want to get that post. So I'm going to take that ID, fetch the actual post that goes along with it, and show it on the page. So to do this, uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to use a MongoDB cap collection. And these are really useful. Uh, they're uh, essentially a database collection, but it has like a max size. You can either do it by count or by file size. Um, and file size is actually really neat because uh, the way that it works, it, it can avoid any kind of fragmentation issues. So the database, database doesn't need to grow or shrink, and it'll just last forever at that size and just keep working. So let's say it'll have like a max of 1,000 events. But that's fine for this because they don't need to live very long. This is just to notify a user. It's not to do anything that we need to back up or keep forever. So I'm doing this in a general way where I have an event called post, you know, like a new post is created. And I say what the ID is of it as well as who created it. So when I save this, the other interesting thing I can do with cap collections is, given a WebSocket, although it's not strictly necessary for this, um, I can create a tailing query. And this is just a node stream that will just stay open until I close it. And it's just going to watch all the events. And every time one comes in, I'll get a notification. I found out last night, actually, that RethinkDB can do this with all collections. So that's neat. But with MongoDB, we can still do it. We just have to use a cap collection. And so yeah, so basically looking for the events. And as one comes in, you know, a new post or something, then we're just going to emit that same event back out to the WebSocket. And in Angular, I can listen on this. I have a WebSocket service. It's just a really simple like, link between the actual WebSocket and just emitting events here. And when we get a post event that comes in, we just look it up with the API, and we add the new post to the setup. So now with this in place, once I add a post, it shows up on both, no problem. And this could really be extended to do a lot more than just you know, showing new posts. That's why I wrote it in a general way. Like, for example, you could add a chat feature where uh, you just need to add a new event, and it can have a content, right? Because it's MongoDB, so you know, concerning any arbitrary content. You don't have to be limited to whatever schema you define. So we wouldn't need any more collections or anything. We just have to have some request that creates this chat message, and Angular can choose to listen on whatever controller it wants for this event to be happening. Another idea that, that I had with this was uh, if you get the geo coordinates, which this is all you need to do in HTML5. It's really simple to get geo in HTML5. There's, this will like, you know, show the message to the user, like, do you want to give access and all that stuff. Um, and as long as I store the geo coordinates in, in an event for some reason, then I can look at it uh, just by saying dot near those GPS coordinates. So I could look like within five miles or whatever. I don't know what the units are. Um, but I can just look to see, is there anything happening near me? So at this in place, we have a you know, real simple, scalable, maintainable API. Same thing on the front end, real testable, easy to manage. Um, in fact, if we wanted to scrap the front end and write this in like a mobile app or something, nothing on the back end would have to change. Um, we get push updates so the user can be notified of any arbitrary event that we wanted to find. And we can even extend this to Geo. So thank you. Not with me. <laughs> I should have brought that. Can you talk about the uh, cap collection more? I kind of missed that a little bit, how that works in Mongo. And yeah, so I think the most common use case for cap collection is for logging. It's just a really easy way to get uh, centralized JSON logging. Because with logging, I'm assuming that you don't need to keep your logs. right? So if you don't need to keep your logs, it's just there for you know, check diagnostics and stuff. Uh, MongoDB is a pretty good place to store it because um, you can keep adding stuff in, but if it gets beyond 
you know, either a file size or a certain number count, and the oldest one will just be automatically trimmed off the, the back of it. So in SQL, you, would, you could do this, but you would have to have a trim. Um, so you do a query, then you trim afterwards. Uh, but the, the advantage of using it in this case is because I can, I can keep a tailing query on it. So I can just keep a connection open. They'll just tell me as data comes in that matches my uh, predicate. All right, well, thank you.